Hey guys, welcome back to our final lecture on the United States Civil War. Uh, today we are going to wrap up the, the major fighting, the battles, uh, and we'll also take a look at the legacy of the uh, American Civil War, um, not only in terms of its impact on military history, but also we'll take a look at its impact on the rest of the history of the United States. Um, it, it, it is a legacy that still lives with us. I mean, all you have to do is turn on uh, the television. Um, I mean, and even, you know, we're in the middle of this global pandemic right now. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm even turning on television and seeing in certain protests, the, the stars and bars of the Confederacy. You know, why is that still such a, a present element in our society here in 2020? Um, you know, the, the legacy of this time period is still with us. Um, uh, 100%. So uh, we are going to, um, uh, we'll finish there and uh, also kind of foreshadow our next uh, lecture series that we're going to begin taking a look at is reconstruction as it led into the civil rights struggle. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let me pull up the presentation. All right, and we will get started. So um, 1864, 1864 was an election year. It was a presidential election year. Um, now, it was not a foregone conclusion that Abraham Lincoln would win re-election in 1864. There were anti-war uh, candidates that were very active and, and at times have been very popular um, in the, the preceding this election. Um, a lot of Northerners are, are calling for some kind of negotiated settlement with the Confederacy, given how poorly the, the war had been going at various times. So, uh, you know, Lincoln is really going to kind of ramp up and we're going to see, uh, especially in the summer of 1864 into the fall, we're going to see some major campaigns um, that are successful for the Union and probably help uh, get Lincoln, uh, not probably, do help get Lincoln elected. Um, so, you know, there's some political motivations behind the military strategy that uh, Lincoln is engaging here. Um, but again, you know, I, I want to remind you that, you know, living in the moment, you know, we, we always study this as, as history. We know the outcome. We know what's going to happen in the moment. Uh, like every historical event we study, they have no idea how things are going to turn out. They did not know that it was a foregone conclusion that the, the North would win. Uh, the war was still kind of a toss up. Um, even here after Gettysburg and all that, uh, we still didn't know how it was going to end. So, um, there had been some, remember, after Grant took over in the East, there were some brutal battles. I mean, the, the North was losing man after man after man. Um, and even though they were strategically in a good position, you know, ultimately, I mean, you can't sustain that many heavy losses without it affecting the public morale. So uh, 1864, there was a very, uh, you know, pivotal moment uh, in which uh, we could have seen Lincoln replaced with a, an anti-war candidate. Um, but given the success of these campaigns, that uh, is not what happened. Um, the, the policies towards the South are going to be much more violent, much more destructive. He is going to unleash um, General Sherman, General Sheridan uh, in the South. And really, it's those victories in the South that really kind of stave off any political uh, dissidents. Uh, the, the second time, so Lincoln does win uh, election in 1864. Uh, his second inaugural address um, really reemphasized his original goal, and that was to, uh, to keep the Union together. That, that's kind of the main focus of his address. But he adds a very specific element to his second inaugural address that was missing in the first, and that is he does mention security of equality for all. Okay, securing equality for all. So, um, you know, that could easily be applied to uh, these 4 million people in the South that are enslaved at this, this current time. Um, so, second inaugural address kind of reflects uh, how the, the motivation for the war has changed over the last four years. Um, and uh, let, let's move on down to the Atlanta campaign, May to September of 1862, one of the more famous uh, offenses of the entire war. You have Sherman, who's taken over uh, in the West, and uh, he is going to march basically from Tennessee uh, and invade Georgia. Specifically, uh, they are heading towards a supply depot in Atlanta. So Atlanta, Georgia, very important for the South, major supply depot. They besiege the city, and ultimately it will fall on September 2nd of 1864. Um, it's over those next few months that we're going to have the infamous Sherman's March to the Sea. Uh, from November to December uh, of 1864, 
uh, after Atlanta has fallen. Sherman instru- basically instituted a, a total war policy. And I've used that term a few times. Remember, total war is in which uh, a policy in which they're uh, they, they don't just attack military targets. Uh, they, they're also, you know, burning industrial areas, areas that are, are able to make the war happen. Um, we're going to see this, you know, later on and especially World War II, you know, where these massive bombing campaigns of, of just major cities that are falling, you know, even looking at Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I mean, those were two uh, key industrial cities that were making the war possible for Japan. So leveling those two cities. Well, that's kind of what Sherman's doing here. Um, you know, they, they are taking the war to the people of the South, making them feel it, uh, not just attacking military targets, but burning infrastructure like bridges um, and also civilian property. I mean, they are burning uh, farms, they're burning houses, and uh, ultimately, this is called a scorched earth policy. You can see how wide um, uh, Sherman's uh, men are, are actually marching. Um, it was about 40 miles wide, but this scorched earth policy um, basically calls for uh, the Union to either destroy or plunder everything of value, um, which not only, you know, Goal number one was to terrorize the the civilian population um, in in hopes that they would want to bring about an end to the war, um, but also uh, keep damage um, you know keep damaging the war effort of the South. So, you know th- this is something um, this is very important to try and bring the uh, the South. Uh, uh, you know, make them feel the war. You know, war is hell. Um, so. After uh, the scorch earth policy, we see that uh, if we move back up north, we can see here that, let me go back, there we go, Sheridan captures Richmond. April of 1865, the, the game is almost up. Uh, basically, you have uh, Sheridan has been active in the north, and Lee has to spread his army way too thin uh, and defend a, a trench line that, that's about 40 miles long to protect Richmond. You know, think about trying to defend a line 40 miles long. Um, very difficult to do, especially when you are already low on manpower. And so it was basically uh, impossible for Lee to keep that up. It had been a very long winter. Uh, the Confederate Army had suffered from starvation, uh, desertion, disease. Um, and in March, the Union was able to break the Confederate lines and they were able to capture Richmond. Lee will take off to the West. It is not, uh, it is not over uh, yet. But uh, within a week, uh, Lee would o- offer his surrender at a, a little place called Appomattox. Um, what's interesting is uh, one of my favorite stories uh, of the Civil War is that uh, there was a farmer who uh, owned property in Virginia. Um, and the very first battle of the Civil War, uh, Battle of Bull Run, took place on his property. Um, he took his family, they, they fled uh, further south um, to try and escape some of the, the fighting, the war, and he bought a little farm land called uh, Appomattox. And so uh, he would, for the rest of his life, this farmer would say that, um, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically that the war had begun in his backyard uh, and it had ended in his parlor room, uh, which was very accurate. So uh, Lee would surrender uh, at Appomattox Courthouse, uh, at the, the building there at Appomattox, um, and uh, the grant would meet him. Um, the The surrender process, um, you know, Lee had a number of his troops there. They uh, surrendered their weapons, um, but they were allowed to return home with their their mounts or their horses. Uh, if they, um, especially those that were owned by individual soldiers, because Grant understood here that, uh, you know, these men are going to have to be incorporated back into our country as soon as this is over. Um, you know, these men who have fought, you know, and, and risked their lives uh, for this failed and horrible experiment, um, they are going to have to be incorporated. So, you know, he's not necessarily here to punish them. He allows them to keep their horses because, again, most people are farmers at this time. You have to have a horse in this era in order to to farm vast amounts of land. So, you know, he, he did understand that uh, that would be, uh, something that would be beneficial to the, the Confederate soldiers, but uh, um, 
they were also starving. Um, Grant would also give them 25,000 Union food rations. Um, and uh, many of these soldiers had not eaten for days. Many of them didn't have shoes. I mean, it was a very pitiful bunch uh, that ended up surrendering. The, the war couldn't have gone on much later. Uh, now, I, that being said, uh, uh, the war did actually continue in various parts of, uh, of the country. Uh, in fact, I mentioned earlier in our naval lecture, how the, there were actually men uh, out at sea for four months after this, this fact um, that did not realize that the war had come to an end. So Lee's, Lee represents kind of the end of the war because uh, he had the biggest army. Right. He, he, his was the most important. And, uh, you know, he had been protecting the capital. So when he's done, it's pretty much over for everyone else. But there will be sporadic fighting out in the Western Theater, um, Trans Mississippi Theater um, uh, as well. Uh, one last note about this surrender at Appomattox. Um, I really found it, it it's very sad uh, what Grant ended up writing in his memoirs about this moment. Because he had a lot of respect for Robert E. Lee. Uh, Robert E. Lee, you know, these, these men had gone to you know, school, not necessarily these two, but, you know, a lot of these generals, they'd grown up together going to military colleges. Um, you know, many of them knew each other. Uh, they had served, you know, in previous wars, like the Mexican-American War. So, you know, there was a, a level of admiration and respect among the uh, leadership of the Union and Confederacy. But, you um, Grant uh, said in his memoirs later on, and I'll, I'll read a direct quote here, um, after the negotiations were over, quote, he felt sad and depressed at the downfall of a foe who had fought so long and valiantly and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause I was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people have ever fought. And I, I wholeheartedly agree with Grant there. Um, you know, he recognized the tremendous sacrifice. Um, you know, these men had, had risked their lives for this idea, but ultimately um, that idea, uh, there's no way to separate it out uh, from slavery. I mean, ultimately slavery is in, intertwined uh, with the South, with the Confederacy. Um, and again, going back to our original lectures, you only have to go as far as looking at these secession documents uh, written by many of these state governments um, that, you know, for example, Mississippi has, you know, stating, uh, you know, for the protection of the institution of slavery in their proclamation of secession. So, you know, Grant recognized, like, these, these men fought bravely, they fought hard, Lee was an amazing general, um, but the worst cause that, that anyone has ever imagined. Um, so, you know, a very pitiful uh, situation. Um, a few days after this, and the, you know, this is the most tragic uh, of, of all, five days after Lee's surrender at Appomattox, um, you know, President Lincoln, imagine the moment, right? Lincoln has just survived four years of this brutal war. Um, it looks as if, uh, you know, finally we're seeing kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, five days after Lee's surrender, President Lincoln will attend a play um, with his wife um, and also uh, there was another couple uh, with him. Uh, when Lincoln attends this play at Ford's Theater, um, uh, a man by the name of John Wilkes Booth, um, who was a famous actor uh, of the time. I, I think, I feel like we've kind of uh, forgotten this over time. You know, this, he would, he would have been recognizable pretty much by anybody uh, on the street. So, you know, uh, you know, imagine if, uh, you know, I, Imagine if like Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise ended up like assassinating the president. Now, uh, you know, granted, not uh, nearly as uh, as popular globally as as those two. John Wilkes Booth was a very famous figure, and I want everybody to understand that. Um, you know, so imagine if if the news came out, we would say, "What, Brad Pitt? What? Are you serious?" Uh, and that's how people reacted here. John Wilkes Booth was an actor uh, and. It allowed him to gain access to uh, the stage that night. It allowed him to gain access to the theater. Um, and so uh, John Wilkes Booth, who was a pro-Southern uh, sympathizer, um, he decided that, uh, and, and I should mention, this is a part of a broader conspiracy. It's not just John Wilkes Booth that is um, uh, committing this, this murder. Uh, there were also uh, numerous other men that were involved in this. The idea was to basically cut off the head of the snake. You kill the president, the vice president, uh, the secretary of war, um, uh, Stanton, I believe, was uh, was also attacked this night. There were about four or five guys that ended up, uh, they were going to basically take out the kind of the cabinet, uh, the war cabinet. 
And most of the guys either chickened out, um, got cold feet. Uh, there, I believe Stanton was the only one that uh, his assassin actually tried to carry it out. Stanton had actually gotten in an accident, uh, a horse carriage accident, uh, and had this huge metal brace on his neck. And uh, when his attacker arrived and bust through the door, uh, he, he, with a knife, went towards Stanton and, and began to uh, stab at him. Uh, really, the only thing that saved his life was probably that neck brace, um, which is just crazy part of the tale, I guess. But uh, he would be stabbed a, a few times, but would survive those. Lincoln would be the only official that would die that night. Um, but John Wilkes Booth, as I said, he gained entrance to the president's um, uh, room in the kind of upper deck of this theater. Uh, he slowly snuck up um, uh, through the door and went in behind Abraham Lincoln, slowly pulled out a very small gun and uh, fired a shot directly into the back of his head. Uh, immediately afterwards, um, uh, there, again, there was a young, and I can't remember his rank, I think a young captain or something in the room with, uh, the Lincolns. Uh, he tried to subdue John Wilkes Booth. Uh, John Wilkes Booth pulled out a knife, uh, slashed his arm, um, and then attempted to jump over the, the balcony onto the stage and, uh, leave with flair, I guess. Um, the, uh, the jump, uh, was not successful. Uh, his, Spur, I believe, got caught on the flag that had been draped in front of the president's box. Uh, and so he tumbled forward uh, rather awkwardly and ended up, uh, when he landed, broke a bone in his leg. Um, there was mass confusion. I mean, because, uh, you know, people had heard the gunshot, um, but, you know, in that moment, they didn't know exactly what had happened, this loud bang. And then you see John Wilkes Booth run up uh, and he hobbles onto stage and he shouts, Sick Semper Tyrannus, which means uh, death to tyrants. And um, he ends up uh, at that point, you know, holding up this bloody, bloody dagger, you know, and people, you know, know him as this actor. They're thinking, you know, this is so strange. Like, but then they start hearing the screams from the president's booth and they realize that the president has been shot. Um, John Wilkes Booth is able to escape out the back of the theater. Uh, he um, had, had paid a, a young boy to hold on to his horse. He gets on the horse and he would basically be on the run uh, for quite a while. Um, for I, I think a few weeks um, before he was eventually caught and uh, and he was killed. Um, you know, Lincoln had survived four years of the the most terrible conflict our nation has ever experienced, only to have his life taken um, in the you know as the conflict was coming to an end. Just a, a tragic, tragic way to end such a tragic event already. Um, so. You know, that would, uh, uh, as I said, even though there is fighting that will continue over the course of the next few weeks, um, these are kind of the main moments that uh, we remember is kind of bringing about an end to the Civil War. With that being said, uh, let's kind of step back and take a look at uh, what then is the legacy of the Civil War. Um, you know, this has often been considered the first modern war by historians for uh, a couple different reasons. Um, you know, it had a major foundation, uh, or excuse me, major impact impact on uh, how our our current modern states, um, you know, our a relationship in government, the power of the executive and all that. Uh, it had a major impact on how the federal government uh, was able to operate because the federal government would expand quite a bit after this. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll see that, uh, you know, really throughout history, the, the executive tends to expand. It hardly ever contracts. And that's a major lesson I would like you to uh, take away from this entire class. Um, but uh, ultimately, the federal government is going to become a much bigger influence in people's lives. State governments are going to become a much less uh, important, less influential uh, impact in people's lives. And number two, um, it's also called the modern, first modern war because this really does change the way that wars are fought. Um, modern warfare from here on out, for the most part, would be a total war. You know, the, the days of the Napoleonic, you know, two huge armies marching towards each, each other in an open field, stopping, uh, you know, firing, reloading. You just don't have that. I mean, this is trench warfare. This is burning people's homes. This is, uh, you know, scorched earth. This is 
this is completely total war. Uh, we're going to see it later on uh, in World War One. We're going to see it, uh, you know, later on in World War Two. Um, so, you know, a lot of different uh, impacts here. So let's go ahead and start with, uh, I have listed out six different uh, legacies the, the Civil War has left with us. Number one, modern weapons. Um, we didn't really get too much into the weaponry of this war, but, you know, you do have some inventions that um, are, are fairly interesting. Um, first and foremost, that made this war so deadly uh, was what was called rifling. Okay, rifling. Um, so instead of the old muskets, like, uh, you know, we, we talked about in the American Revolution, instead of that, uh, the guns that have been created for this war um, have a long barrel. And inside there is carved a little groove that spirals. What that means is that the bullet as it exits is not going flat, right? If you've ever fired, um, I don't know, a Nerf gun or something, right? Um, if you've ever fired one of those or a BB gun, you know, it, it throws it out flat and it can go any direction, right? Uh, think of like a pitcher's knuckleball, right? If they throw that ball flat, it goes any direction. You don't know where it's going to end up. But if you throw it like Patrick Mahomes, right? Throw a football like Patrick Mahomes, think about what he does. He throws it, puts spin on it, and it becomes much more accurate. Well, that's what happens here. Uh, the rifles that are used in the Civil War are extremely accurate. Um, Maybe not as accurate as Patrick Mahomes, but uh, they are extremely accurate um, in uh, where they are putting, uh, you know, they're, they're firing at people and they are hitting them. Um, so that means that there are a lot more casualties because of that. Um, and also rifles uh, at this time could fire about two to three times faster than previous um, guns. So you know, the accuracy has improved quite a bit. Um, the deadliness of those weapons um, has improved quite a bit. There have been other weapons that have been created. The Gatling gun, uh, that's always a, a favorite one people like to talk about. And it's really kind of the predecessor to the modern machine gun. Um, but you would have, you know, this long uh, tank of water uh, with a barrel going through it to keep it cool. Uh, and you could basically crank out bullets and, uh, you know, firing, uh, you know, dozens of bullets and just in, you know, seconds, basically. Um, uh, other types, I guess, of, of weapons here, um, you know, not necessarily a weapon, but railroads are going to be tremendously important in getting, um, you know, troops mobilized and getting communication and getting, um, uh, in getting supplies to those uh, that were necessary, although they were vulnerable to sabotage, you know that is another modern invention uh, that is is really having an impact here. Steamships, um, another modern invention there. Naval warfare we already talked about, but um, you know those those uh, uh, and frankly ma mainly southern uh, innovations, uh, you know ironclads. Uh, we also see a very early use of submarines during this war. Um, not necessarily for the, uh, you know, at, at the same level that we'll see, of course, in later wars, we see the first torpedoes. I mean, this is uh, uh, underwater mines uh, because of this. So, you know, warfare has now gone under underneath the water uh, as well. That's a, a major, major um, change that we're going to see affect how other major wars are fought. Let's move down to number two here, the strategy of total war, especially used by the North, Sherman, Sheridan, we just discussed. Um, you know, this, uh, this policy of total war, um, you know, viewed the enemy, not just as a hostile army, it's not just the army, but also a hostile people. You know, the, the idea was that they were the ones that had created this war, right? They were the ones that had ultimately, uh, it was their fault, right? We need to make them feel it, right? If they can't feel the impact that, um, of the war, they're going to want to continue fighting. So, um, you know, the goal really isn't just to destroy armies, it's to destroy infrastructure as well. If you can stop their ability to wage war, you will stop the war. And that makes sense, right? As I said, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, and World War II, you know, industrial cities, we stop their ability uh, to make war. And that obviously laid examples in that war, but, um, you know, same, same idea. Um, but really, you know, the, the strategy of total war, if you can get them, destroy their will to fight, right? So it's, it's psychological as well as um, uh, material and, and strategical. Um, that scorched earth policy, you know, results in, in the terrorizing of the South, which does uh, increase soldier desertions, uh, effects on civil 
life in the South, uh, made the South want to end the war. So it absolutely works too. Total war absolutely works. Number three, um, short one here, but it, it is interesting to see. You know, we are beginning to witness the beginnings of trench warfare. Of course, World War One would so heavily be fought using trench warfare. Um, especially during the siege of Richmond, we'll see that the Union has engaged in very long, protracted trench lines, right? I mean, you had a 40-mile stretch of land that the uh, that Lee's army was trying to defend. They're basically, they, they're dug in, right? They've, they've made these long trenches. Uh, I've been to num numerous battlefields, and you can actually see many uh, trench lines that, that still exist. Um, the Battle of the Wilderness is one that I'm, I'm thinking of off the top of my head. Number four, uh, and this is a very, very, very important one if you want to understand modern America, and that is uh, the decline of the South. Guys, up until this time, the South had been uh, just as, uh, if not more, wealthy than the North. Remember, we talked about uh, the it, where the money was invested, though, right? In the North, you have it invested in in uh, industry. You have it invested in machines. Uh, in the South, it was invested in slaves. Right. And uh, so, you know, basically after we, we passed the 13th Amendment, which we'll talk about in our reconstruction portion, um, the investment literally walks off the farm. Right. It's gone. All right, uh, that money that they have uh, had, you know, old money, uh, generations of, of, of wealthy farm owners, uh, it just disappears. It literally walks off. This is um, a, a major impact on the South economically. But uh, let's not forget the, uh, the, the, the physical impact as well. Um, 260,000 men are going to die uh, for the South. So you have a, a tremendous decline in population in the South. The infrastructure is pretty much destroyed in the South. Bridges, um, you know, um, uh, industrial, what little industrial capacity actually existed. Um, the South before, in 1860, the South had about 30% of the nation's wealth, right? We talked about how about 30% of the nation's wealth was in the South. By 1870, all right, so about five years after the war ends, it only has 12%, right? They lose 20% of the nation's value in that time, all right? 12% of the nation's wealth is in the South. Um, all that money invested in slave labor has been lost, uh, whereas Northern investment remains intact. Number five, I think this also plays into, uh, and I guess before I, I leave the South, you know, you still drive through parts of the South. It's still the poorest region in the entire country today, for the most part. Um, you know, it's um, in, in some ways they've never recovered. And in other ways, you know, we'll see a return of industry and in, especially in World War II, the Sun Belt, uh, kind of that, that Southern region stretching all the way to the West. But um, man, they are, they're in pitiful shape. Um, and uh, frankly, even still to this day, uh, remain much more impoverished than many other parts of the country. Number five, uh, the rise of industrial capital. Um, I want to go back to the very first unit that we discussed and, uh, you know, that American revolution and getting into the early Republic. Uh, it was Jefferson versus Hamilton, right? We had two conflicting ideas. Uh, Jefferson with the agrarian lifestyle, Hamilton with the industrialized manufacturing lifestyle, which would end up. This answers it. The, the Civil War is the beginning of the end for that, in, that agrarian Jeffersonian model of what America should be. Um, it is going to slowly dwindle. Um, we are going to see the rise of, of capitalism, industrial capitalism in the North. Uh, Hamilton's vision does come to fruition. Um, I, I want to look at some numbers, which I think show this uh, quite drastically over the next few decades. Uh, in every census, they, uh, they ask what your occupation is is. And so uh, we, we, can, we can basically, statistically, we can look at how many farmers uh, there were in the decades following. So in 1860, um, the, the year right before the uh, Civil War, there were about 58% of Americans were farmers, all right? 58%. The next decade, they dropped by 5%. The following decade, it dropped another 5%. 1890, it dropped about 6%. By 1900, um, it dropped another 5%. So every year, we're, we're dropping 5% more. Uh, by 1910, we are down to 31%. By 1920, 27%. By 1930, 21%. By 1940, um, you know, on the cusp of World War II, only 18% of Americans 
uh, were farmers. And of course, after the war, that would increase, uh, that would, excuse me, decrease drash- drastically. Um, fast forward uh, to today, okay? Farmers account for 2% of the population, 2%. Okay. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, you know, not only the rise of, of cities and the suburbs, but, uh, you know, also the rise of um, corporate farming. Um, industry has really taken over uh, farmland. And, uh, you know, a lot of farms are now corporate, but only 2% of the population today are, pop, uh, are farmers. Hamilton versus Jefferson, you know, Jefferson might have had the right idea in the short term, but uh, ultimately Hamilton's was the one that won out. So we finally have kind of an answer uh, to that question. Right or wrong, uh, that's how things ultimately played out. And the final piece that I'll leave you guys with is uh, the rise of the federal government. I, I somewhat introduced this at the beginning, but uh, the federal government would, of course, greatly extend their power over the next few decades, uh, starting with massive reconstruction programs, uh, which we are going to introduce in our next lectures to rebuild the South um, and implement laws um, protecting social equality. And just a little hint, um, it doesn't work out, uh, but continuing to grow in scope and power. And there would be you know, moments over the next few decades, especially when we get to the New Deal of the 1930s and the Great Depression, where the, the government would grow tremendously you know, exponentially almost. Um, but, uh, you know, we've, we've set the stage now to where, uh, we're, we're going to see the federal government having an increased role versus state governments, right. Um, as, as what has happened in the past, ladies and gentlemen, this will do it for our, uh, our lectures over the civil war. Um, it's, it's been a, uh, a long, fascinating unit. I hope you've been able to, to learn a few things about the, uh, the fighting. Um, you know, I guess the, the final message I would leave you with is that, um, you know, I, I think often we, we romanticize war uh, too, too often, right? Um, and when you think about uh, the, these men and women that, um, that, that died in this conflict, um, this is the most tragic war in American history. Um, you know, these were, these were husbands and brothers and sons uh, that were sent off to die. Um, and, you know, even though we, we do kind of romanticize the, uh, the, the long lasting impacts of this war, um, uh, ultimately war is, is tragic. And it's sad that we could not reach, um, uh, you know, political situation to dissolve slavery. Um, and it did come to, uh, to the civil war, but, um, I will always honor and respect the sacrifice of those men who gave their lives, um, to, uh, to make, um, uh, America a more perfect union. So anyways, I will leave you with that. Thank you for tuning in. And as always, please feel free to email me with any questions you may have. Have a great day.